John chapter 16. So let's pray, and then we will go into our text. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the word of God. It is truth. It is life. I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit of God uh, moved men of old to, to write these inspired words of Scripture, and that they are profitable to us. They teach us. They correct us. They break us down, and they build us up, and they make every believer equipped to do every good work that you've called us to do. And for the unbeliever, Father, the same word breaks the hard and stony heart. It is like a fire burning. And I pray, Father, that everyone here will know and believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and that they will have faith alone in Jesus Christ, that they will have the righteousness of Christ and not be living according to their own self-righteousness and that they will not ever face the condemnation, but that they will have eternal life in Christ. Thank you for these words of Scripture. They are beautiful, they are truth, and I pray that they will be transformational. We give you the honor and glory, Father. Teach us, we pray. Amen. So these words in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 15, pick up the story of the upper room discourse. It is the night in which Jesus is, be is being betrayed. Judas has gone out. He has left the Last Supper. He has gone to make arrangements to bring the guards with torches and weapons into the Garden of Gethsemane, where he knows Jesus will end up that evening. And there, Jesus will be betrayed by a kiss, and he will be arrested. And then we know just short hours from then, after some completely unfair and unjust trials, he will be nailed to the cross, naked and shamed, beaten and bloody, and there he will pay the sin of the world in his own body. He will die at 3 o'clock that afternoon, and then he will be laid in a grave, only to rise from the dead on the first day of the week. What a glorious story of redemption. But here, Jesus is facing unspeakable suffering. I can't even describe what he will suffer for you and I on the cross. This is what's looming before him. And, and for me, when, when something large and chaotic is looming in front of me, I, I'm, I'm a basket case. I, I cannot think. I, 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 can, I, I am just completely at odds with, with life. Here, Jesus is facing this unspeakable suffering, and he's talking to his disciples, teaching and training them to the last moment. He is going to be giving them the deposit of the gospel by which they will proclaim the truth and they will, the church will be established. These are, these are young men, late teens, early 20s. He's, he's handing over the gospel, his death and resurrection, the great news of that, to teenagers and 20-year-olds. And, and here, as he's, he's comforting them, let's, let's look at Scripture. John chapter 16, verse 5, we will find out that these young teenager, 20-year-olds, are preoccupied with self. Okay, that's my first thought in verse 5, preoccupied with self. Look at verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me. He, he's telling his disciples again that night. He's saying, I am going away. I, I'm leaving you. I'm departing. I'm going back to be with my father who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? Now listen, earlier in John 13, 36, Peter did say, Jesus, where are you going? He told them he was departing, and Peter's like, where are you going, Lord? So he did, Peter did ask. And then Thomas, in John chapter 14, Thomas says the same thing. Lord, where are you going, and how will we know the way? So, so what, is the, what is this talking about? Jesus is saying, I believe, none of you really, truly care about where I'm going and what I'm going to do. Listen, disciples, listen, young people, you have no idea that in the next few hours, I will be nailed to a cross, and my Father, the God of heaven, who is equal God with me, there is one God, three persons, my Father will pour upon me his anger, his wrath, unleashing and unloading the Father's anger toward sin on the innocent son who is a substitute. He's saying, you guys don't care where I'm going. None of you are asking me the details about where am I going and what am I going to accomplish for you. All you are is preoccupied with the fact that I can't be there to take care of you anymore. No more earthly comforts. You have a question, you come right to me. You want to know where to get bread? We'll make it right now. You, you want to know where we're going next? I tell you, 
you're only concerned with self. Today's circumstance, today's issues, and boy, isn't that true about you and I as well? Sometimes when we're in life, life becomes so consuming with the details of, hey, where do I live, my job, what do I do, on and on, um, where am I going next month, when, you know, when do I graduate, my next assignment, my next thing, and the day-to-day -day life becomes so preoccupied, we become so preoccupied with it that we never ask, uh, well, what does the Lord think, what does the Lord want, what is the Lord trying to do here? Listen, the disciples are looking into a mirror, and they're only seeing themselves, when they should be looking in through a glass and seeing only Jesus. So remember that, because I'm going to end with that. The disciples are so preoccupied with, hey, we're not going to have Jesus anymore, so who's going to lead us around? Where are we going to stay? What are we going to do? Do we go back to fishing? Do we have to go back and live with my parents? Like, what are we going to do now? They're so occupied by that, rather than looking at Jesus saying, what are you going to do? In the next few days, Jesus, what are you, what are you going to experience for us? Where, when you go, what's it going to feel like for you? Why would you do this? Do you love us that much? None of those questions, right? Sometimes we just get so busy about self, we, we forget the Lord, and it happens in, in ministry. He not only is going to experience unspeakable suffering, he's actually going to rise from the dead in inexpressible glory. They could have asked about that. They could have said, so Jesus, you're going to die on the cross by the hands of wicked men, and then you're going to pay our sins, and then, what do you, then you're going to rise from the dead like you've been telling us three times in recent weeks? What is that going to be like when you rise from the dead? What kind of body? Will we be able to touch you? Can you eat? They don't ask any of those questions. They're too busy with me, 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 my, 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 right? I think I would be too. So the Lord says this in verse 6, But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart, concerned only about today and the earthly things of today. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. There's a gain for you. It's actually better for you that I do go away, he says. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. What Jesus says in verse 6 and 7 is this. It is to your gain and to your advantage that I leave. You don't understand it yet, but I want you to. Because when I leave, I can finally send you the helper who is the Holy Spirit. Let me give you two reasons why that is better. I think if we were to ask us, if I were to ask you, would you rather have the Holy Spirit living in you or would you rather have Jesus physically on earth where you could go talk to him and shake his hand at any time? Which would you prefer? I think most of us would say, I would prefer to have Jesus on earth so I could see him and hear his voice audibly and then watch one of those miracles. That would help my faith. And Jesus says in this text, no, it is to your advantage. Here's why. First of all, God made an old covenant, right? God made an old covenant. And the old covenant in Jeremiah 31 is this. The old covenant was the tables of stone, Ten Commandments. It was external, right? The Ten Commandments were on pieces of stone outside of somebody's body, and they were the list of God's holy standard. And nobody can keep the Ten Commandments because we have all sinned against God. We have no power within us to obey the word perfectly, to obey God's um, standards 100%, right? We've all fallen short of that. So that law, was, the first covenant, was really no good. All it did was condemn me and show me what a wicked sinner I was. I need something different than an external law. Like when I'm driving down the road and I see a speed limit sign, the speed limit signs are simply external laws says what, 45, 50 miles, 55 miles an hour? That's an external law. I need way more than that to make me go the speed limit. What do I need? I need Zach or a state trooper on my tail. Then I'm going the speed, right? I, I need something like that. The external law just is an external law, right? Just shows me that I, I, sped, I was speeding or something. So here's what God promised in Exodus, or I'm sorry, in Ezekiel 36. It, regarding the new covenant, I will give you, he makes a promise, a new heart and put a new spirit within you. See, he's going to take away the heart of stone. The heart of stone is an unbelieving heart. It is one that does not trust God alone for salvation. And he will give them a heart of flesh that will finally be able to beat and love, love God alone. I will put, listen to this, my spirit within you. That's what we need. And until Jesus dies on the cross, rises from the dead, and goes to heaven... 
We can never get the Holy Spirit down here on earth to be put within us. It's a necessary part of the new covenant, and he will cause us to walk in my statutes. So not only does God give us a new nature, and he writes the law of God on my heart, so it's not external on tablets of stone, but he actually puts on my heart as a believer in the church age. He says, Brian, don't covet. Brian, do not commit adultery. Brian, do not lie. Brian, honor your parents. I mean, he, he gives me his standard on my heart, gives me a new nature in my salvation, and then he gives me the Holy Spirit, which is awesome. I need the Holy Spirit or I cannot obey him. So it was necessary. That's why it's to my advantage. If Jesus doesn't leave the earth and go up to heaven, the Holy Spirit could never come down, indwell me, and, and, and then give me the power to obey and please him. But secondly, there's another reason why. And the second reason is God wants to dwell with you and I. He wants to. So when Adam and Eve, when Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, God could no longer dwell with Adam. They were separated because of sin. So then in Exodus, God told Moses, Moses, build me a tent, build me a tabernacle, and I will dwell in there because I want to dwell with my people. However, nobody can get close to me except one person. Who was that? The high priest. Out of one nation, the Jewish nation, on one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16. <laughs> How is that for getting to be with God? How is that to close intimacy? One person out of one nation in all the world, on one day out of all the year, can ever be in the presence of God. But that's the way it was through the whole Old Testament. If you wanted to be close to God, you couldn't. It was, you couldn't get very close. We are just wretched sinners. God had one way to get there through the high priest. And then what happens? Jesus comes, and Jesus is born in Bethlehem of a virgin, and he is fully God and fully man. You guys, Jesus' body, he is the tabernacle or the temple of God. And now, he, since he is fully God and fully man, if you want to get close to God in the Gospels, what do you have to do? Get close to Jesus. But if he's in Capernaum and you're in Jerusalem, you're, you're 60, 70 miles away. He is still on earth, but you're, you still have 70 miles to, to, of cover of distance to cover before you can actually get close to God, right? And then even then, how many people are around Jesus? Tons of people. So if you want to get close to Jesus, you got to push through the crowd. you got to pull people back, and then you can finally get close to Jesus. Jesus says, it's to, it's to your advantage that I go away, because then I can send the helper. He has already told us, this helper, the Holy Spirit, will be in us. So rather than the Lord's physical presence, it's replaced by constant communication to God through the Holy Spirit. Instead of limited access, we have 24 hours a day, every day of the week, God living in us. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body, your physical body, believers, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? The, listen, the Holy Spirit in you constant contact, constant communication with God himself, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You were bought at a price. What was the price? Jesus Christ's death for all of our sins, his unimaginable suffering for our sins on the cross. That's the price. Therefore, our response, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. My, my physical body belongs to God, my spirit belongs to God, and I need to make the most of him. I need to magnify him in my attitude, my words, my actions, everything. He dwells in me. Do you know what this means? I, this, I am never alone. I don't like being alone. I love it and I hate it at the same time. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm an introvert. I hate being with people, but I don't like being alone. How is that for living on earth? But the whole idea is this. I am never alone. I'm going through constant conflict. I'm not alone. God dwells in me. I'm going through intense temptation. I'm not alone. God is in me. Wherever I go, the third person of the Godhead, the Spirit of God in me goes. I cannot escape him. Is that not the greatest? Is that not an advantage? It's a greater advantage to have the Holy Spirit in us than it is to have Jesus Christ physically on this earth. So he says in verse 7 again, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But 
he says, if I depart, I will send him to you. Now listen, there's a twofold ministry of the, Lord, of, of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about the twofold ministry. Here are my two points this morning. My first point is the ministry of the Holy Spirit is at one point here now to the world, to the lost world that's all around us. Listen to verses 8 through 11 again. And when he has come, notice he's sending the Holy Spirit to us, to us in the New Testament church, to believers, those who trust in Jesus Christ by faith alone have the Holy Spirit. By the way, if you do not have faith alone in Jesus Christ, if you're trusting Jesus plus works, Jesus plus religion, Jesus plus anything, you do not have the Holy Spirit. And you are not born again. So we must have the Spirit of God by faith alone. And when he has come, verse 8, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And he will convict of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. This word convict, used 18 times in the New Testament, um, and Je when, every time Jesus used it, this word convict means to show people their sin and to summon them to repentance. To show them their sin, to reveal their sinful state, and then to summon them, to call them to repentance. Conviction should, should bother us. Conviction should show us something is not right. I am a guilty sinner. There's three things that the Holy Spirit convicts us of. First of all, our guilt. That's conviction of sin. Secondly, of righteousness. And that's going to, and I'll show you in a minute, that's going to demonstrate our helplessness, how powerless we are. And then he's going to convict the world, the unbelieving world of judgment, which is your destiny. Three things. Let's talk about the first one. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, and he came on the day of Pentecost, and he's in every believer, he is convicting the world of sin. Now, sin, harmatia, it means to miss the mark. It is our inability or our unwillingness to obey God's commands. Either we are unable to because we have no power of the Holy Spirit in us, or we are unwilling to, and we yield to the flesh, to do what God commands. The result of sin, the result of sin is judgment. Look at what God says in Romans chapter 3, 23, through the Apostle Paul. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person has missed the mark. We have sinned against God. One lie would, would keep us out of heaven for all eternity. And as a result of sin, even one sin in your life, you have fallen short of the glory of God, God's holy and God's perfect standard. Jesus Christ, when he died, paid every single sin of mankind. Every single sin of, of the world is paid. Here's how John says it in his epistle, 1 John 2, verse 2. And he himself, Jesus himself, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Listen, the Holy Spirit is convicting the, the world that they are sinners, that they have fallen short of God's glory, that they have come short of the perfect standard. Trust me, when I'm talking to my unsaved students in the high school, they're like, well, I don't need Jesus. I'm like, well, are you a sinner? No, I'm not a sinner. Have you ever told a lie? Ah, just a small one. Okay, well, you're a liar. Uh, have you ever stolen anything? Nothing big. Okay, but if you, even if you steal something small, you're a thief. You have broken God's law. Therefore, you are under judgment and condemnation. You deserve death. You deserve eternal punishment. And, and the Holy Spirit is working through the word of God, through showing people that they have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for every sin. Every single sin has been paid for by Jesus Christ himself. Those who believe, who trust Jesus Christ, have that weight of sins removed entirely. What a blessing. However, if you reject Jesus Christ, you will pay the penalty of every single one of those sins in a, in a lake of fire, in a place of judgment. So the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of their sin. Take your Bibles. Go with me to Luke 18. You're in John. Go back just one gospel to Luke 18. Here's an example of the Holy Spirit's work in a person's life. As the Holy Spirit convicts them of sin, look at Luke 18, verse 9. Jesus is teaching the disciples earlier now 
prior to the upper room discourse in John 18. Jesus is teaching, and he gives this parable, verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So you've got the religious, those who say, hey, I've got a religion. I, I'm a faithful part of whatever denomination, and, I, and I, I believe in Jesus, but it's also my effort, my work, and I'm better than most people. I, I'm not a bad person. I'm certainly not as bad as this tax collector. Look at verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. A Pharisee is somebody who tried to live by the rules. Whatever God's law said, they tried to obey to the letter. If the Bible said, keep off the grass, they kept off the grass. If the Bible said, step on the grass, they stepped on the grass. They tried to obey every single letter. The problem is, in their heart, their motives were wrong, and they were ultimately ruined and wrecked by sin. They could never be 100% perfect. The other was a tax collector. By the way, tax collectors were despised. They most often were thieves. They charged four times the tax and pocketed a bunch and gave some to Rome, and they made themselves a nice uh, villa someplace uh, on the coast. So here, verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like this other man, or like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. See his attitude? His attitude is, hey, I'm not a sinner. I'm not, uh, I'm not like unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Sure, I have some pretty graphic things in my mind, but I've never actually did them. Um, hey, I give money faithfully to the temple. If anybody's good in this world, I am. Now look at the tax collector, verse 13. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. See the Holy Spirit's conviction? This, ta this tax collector recognizes, I have sinned against God's holy standard. The Holy Spirit is working through his word in this man's life, and he is crushed. He's laid wide open. Verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, righteous, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and who humbles himself will be exalted. You guys, that is not how the world thinks. The world would say the Pharisee goes to heaven and the tax collector goes to hell. Jesus looks at it and says, I see the heart, the one convicted of sin, and then, and then placing their faith in Jesus Christ alone. He's the one that's right with God and goes to heaven. The Pharisee, who's super religious, goes to hell. As you guys know, I'm against religion. I hate religion. And my students think it funny at the high school, and they're like, Mr. Weida, you're a pastor, and you hate religion? I hate religion. Religion is man's way to bind themselves to God. Um, salvation is God came down, paid our sin, and by faith in him, we have a relationship. Look at Acts chapter 2. You know the story of Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter is preaching the very first day that the church began. And basically, his message is from the Old Testament. He's preaching and preaching about um, what the nation Israel has done in rejecting God and his word. And then he ends up with this statement. This Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Lord and Christ. He tells this mammoth crowd, you crucified God in flesh. You crucified your king and Messiah. Now, when they heard this, Listen, listen to this. They were cut to the heart. The Holy Spirit's conviction was revealing to them they are guilty. They're guilty before God. So they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Isn't that great? It's the Holy Spirit's conviction. This is what Jesus said. It's to your advantage that I go away because when I go away, the Holy Spirit will come. He will indwell believers, and through the preaching of the word, the world will be convicted of sin. By your very lives, people, listen to me. By your lives and by your speech, the unsaved world is convicted. And the Holy Spirit works through your life and through your words to show people their need for Jesus Christ. Keep here in Luke 18. We'll be right there. Second thing the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit also convicts of righteousness. Now, we know what righteousness is. Righteousness is right standing before God. And I just showed you that we're all guilty of sin and we're not right before God in our own flesh. Here's what God's word says through Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, but we, you and I, all mankind, are all like an unclean thing. Nobody likes being called an unclean thing, but God does. God calls all humanity an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses 
our self-righteousnesses, all of our religious and good works are like filthy rags, literally like menstrual cloths, which was an abomination to the nation Israel, an unclean time of the month, unclean, um, really, God says, that's what all of our righteousnesses are like, filthy rags. We, are, we all fade as a leaf. You know how a leaf fither, withers up and then just crumbles? You and I, as the world, as unbelievers, with their filthy righteousness, self-righteousness, literally will wither and crumble. And our iniquities, our sin, like the wind, will take us away to places of judgment and doom. Wow, what a, what a tragic story. Isn't that a terrible story of our, of our self-righteousness? No matter, listen, how many people are sitting in churches today trying to do good works, good works, good works, good works as a way to somehow gain favor with God. And God says, no, the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin, that you've rebelled against a holy God and, and you are guilty. And also your self-righteousness can never avail for you. Your self-righteousness will give you no standing before God. As a matter of fact, the only way to get righteousness is 2 Corinthians 5.21. It states, for he, God the Father, has made him Jesus, who knew no sin, Jesus completely without sin, being God in human flesh, became sin for us. To be sin for us, that statement right there, everybody, that is our substitutionary death. Jesus, that's his death for us. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness. That's how we get his righteousness. So the Holy Spirit convicts the world that they're guilty of sin, then the Holy Spirit reveals to the world that our self-righteousness cannot bring us into God's favor. We simply need a gift of God's righteousness, which is, again, only by faith in Jesus Christ. And then the final thing, back uh, when you're thinking of John chapter 16, the third thing that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of is judgment, because the, the leader of this world has been judged. You know what judgment is? Judgment is the, the sentencing based on your, on your moral worth. It is a sentence of a judge, whether it be God or a human judge, of your moral worth. Somebody who's guilty of a crime stands before a judge in one of our local courts, and the judge looks and says, hmm, I can determine your moral worth. Here's your moral worth, 20 years in prison. Another person comes guilty before a judge, and the judge says, hmm, I'm going to sentence your moral worth. I think it's about hmm, five years and a couple years of probation after that. All right, that's how it works. God looks at our personal worth, and if you are without Jesus Christ, without faith in him alone, your judgment is coming up is condemnation because Satan is judged and cast into a lake of fire. Anyone who rejects Jesus Christ is cast in the same place. So judgment, determining one's worth. This is what Satan does. Um, go back to John 16, please. Verse 8. Look at verse 8 with me again. And when he has come, when the Holy Spirit has come, here's what he will do in the New Testament. He will convict the world of sin, showing the world that they're guilty. He will convict them that self-righteousness of man is nothing, but we need God's righteousness that comes only by Christ and of judgment. If you reject Jesus Christ, you will suffer the same fate as the devil, the ruler of this world. Verse 9. He's going to convict of sin because many do not believe in, in Jesus. All the sins are paid for, but if you reject Jesus Christ, you are guilty of the greatest sin, rejecting Jesus. Of righteousness, because Jesus goes to the Father and you see me no more. Jesus is perfect righteousness. He alone can go to heaven and be with the Father. He never sinned. In order for you and I to go to be with the Father, we have to go in Jesus. He's the only way. That's his righteousness. We have to go based on his righteousness. And regarding judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged, let me briefly tell you the most tragic day of human history. The most tragic day will be found in Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation 20, all the unsaved of the world, from Adam and Eve's descendants in Genesis until the last one yet to be born, those who have rejected Jesus Christ, the unsaved, will stand before a great white throne, Jesus himself seated on the throne, and books will be opened. And the books will be a record of all their sin, every sin that the unsaved have ever committed. 
every single evil thought, every evil word, every evil deed written down in a book, but many volumes of books for an individual. That's quite a library. And they will stand before the perfect judge. He will determine their moral worth. He will show them, here is your moral worth. Here is what you've done. Here is your punishment. And they will be cast into this lake of fire where the devil, the false, the antichrist, and the false beast have been placed. And they will never, ever get out. That's the judgment of Satan and all who reject Jesus. But do you know, for those who trust in Jesus alone, there's no books. There's no books of works. There's no books of, of evil deeds. There's no book of sin. There is a book of life. And Jesus opens that book of life. And there, under the W's, I mean, there's a lot of W's probably, W, W, W. And then I'm going to be looking going, okay, where's my name? 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 And then he's going to go, oh, you're right here, Brian. Weta, comma, Brian, A. In the book of life. And he's going to say, enter into the great reward you have as a servant and son of mine. Come home, welcome home. What a difference. See, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. 26 years ago, actually 26 years ago, October 1st, um, the Holy Spirit did this to me when I'm sitting in a hospital bed reading 1 John 1. And I thought I was pretty righteous. I thought I was a pretty good person. I thought God was an angry, bad God that I somehow couldn't find. I wanted to find him. I was serious about my quest to find God. I tried being a Jesuit priest. I would go to these Catholic retreat camps, and for four days, I wouldn't talk. I just thought, okay, I'm not going to talk five days, and maybe God will like me. I'm going to go six days. If I go without talking six days, I think this God of heaven has got to like me a little better than I am right now. I tried everything. I thought, you know what? He's going to like it if I'm super, super good to people. And I try to be good to people. And then I thought, I'm going to give what I could because if I give a lot, this God of heaven, if he's there, he better appreciate a good gift to people. And so here I'm sitting and I'm reading it and I'm thinking, hmm, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And I thought, I'm not a sinner. I, I've never killed anybody and I've never committed fornication. And I'll tell you what, I'm a pretty decent guy. See my self-righteousness? And then the next verse, 1 John 1, 8, says, And if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. And it was like a lightning bolt, you guys. It was, it was a bigger shock to my system than if I had put my hands in the outlet. I was like, all of a sudden the light came on, and I realized, wait a minute. I'm not a good person trying to find some distant God, I'm an evil, rebellious person that he is seeking after. And I got it. It was the Holy Spirit's conviction. But do you know how he did it? He used, like, he used my sister. He used this church, people in this church that are sitting here right now. He used you. He used your lives to do this as, you, as the Holy Spirit convicted me. And, and I was like, I get it. I'm, I get it. I need his righteousness. It is by faith alone. It was absolutely, absolutely glorious. And so finally, let me end with just the second thing that the Holy Spirit's ministry is. That ministry of convicting the lost, and then back in John 16, the ministry of to the believer. Let's finish with these verses. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, Jesus says. He, he would love to talk much more, but you cannot bear them now. There's a limit to their ability and endurance to understand. So verse 13, however, here is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you and I today. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. See, there's the ministry in verse 13. The spirit of truth has come. When he comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. You guys, the Holy Spirit's ministry to the unsaved world is conviction. Conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You see that now, right? The, the Holy Spirit's ministry to you and I is one of obedience through a transformed mind in scriptures. He is going to reveal us the deep, dark, heavy things of, of truth in the word of God. We will hear them and, and we'll get it. And then our lives will be transformed through obedience. Here's how God says it through the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 2.9, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man 
the things which God has prepared for those who love him. All right, we usually use that for what? Talking about heaven. Like, hey, we don't know what heaven is like. Eye hasn't seen heaven. Our ear hasn't heard heaven. And God is going to prepare those things for us because he loves us. I don't think that's the right interpretation at all. Look at the next verse. The next verse, verse 10 says, but God has revealed them to us. Hey, you guys, things that the eye cannot see, things that the ear cannot hear, things that my heart could never figure out on my own, somehow God has revealed them to me through his spirit. This is the ministry of the spirit to me. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Listen to what verse 12 says. Verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You guys, I will read the Bible and I won't get it. I will read the Bible and I'm like, I don't get it. I don't know what, you, what are you trying to say to me, Lord. What, what's this about the Holy Spirit and sin and righteousness and judgment and, and spirit of truth guiding me in all things? I don't get it, Lord. What do you mean? And as I'm praying and as I'm thinking, the Holy Spirit who lives in me is bringing these things, the deep, heavy things of God, into understanding. And I'm like, I get it. The Holy Spirit wants me to take God's word. He wants me to put it into my heart and mind, meditate on it, think about it. He wants to empower me to obey it. So it's transformation through obedience. What he says, I will do. He's given me the power and ability. He wants me to preach the gospel. I will. Am I comfortable? Not at all. Would I rather be home sitting in a chair? You bet. But that's not what God has called me to do. So I'm going to do it. He's empowering me to obey. It's, this is what Jesus says the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. And my question to you is, are you a willing vessel for him to do that with? Are you willing to be transformed through obedience to the scriptures? He will guide us into all truths, give us understanding of his word, and then as we apply it in our life, we become a, a way that the Holy Spirit can convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I mean, I have seen it over and over and over. I was walking in the streets of Jerusalem m some years ago, and uh, just around the old city, uh, I, we had an evening off, and I was all by myself just walking the streets, and a Korean lady came crying, and, and she had lost something, and, and, I, and she spoke English, and, and I, said, I said, well, let me help you. So we went on a search, every place she could have gone in the old city, and, it's, and, and we, to no avail. And then I said, well, where are you staying? And she said, to such and such a hotel. And, and I walked her there, and, um, and she said, um, wh who are you? Why, why would you take this time to go out, wander the streets to help me find something that means nothing to you? And I said, well, because I, I care about you, because God cares about me, and he cares about you. Can I tell you how God has cared about me? God has cared about me in just incredible ways. His son, Jesus, came to earth and died for me, and he died for you, and our sins are paid in full. As a matter of fact, he died right over here. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? It was amazing. Um, but I just, it was just an amazing, incredible thing. Um, are you willing to just be so transformed by God's word that, you, that God could just use you wherever you are this week? Somebody is in need of the gospel that you are going to connect with this week. You know that, right? You are going to rub shoulders and be around people that the Holy Spirit wants to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's why you're here. That's, that's our ministry. So I'm just going to ask you two quick questions by way of closing. God does not use the wood pulpit, the building. He doesn't use our church vans. He doesn't use our education to change this world. He uses the message of the, go of the gospel, the message of the cross, through us. So are you willing to say, Lord, I want to be used by you. I will. This week, I'm going to make it my goal to saturate, my, saturate myself in your word so that your thoughts are my thoughts and your ways are my ways. And then when I go out, I'm going to be ready for whatever happens. Anything that happens in this world, I'm going to look at like Christ looks at. Instead of being preoccupied with myself, looking at a mirror, I'm going to be looking at Jesus, and everybody's going to see that my attention's on Jesus. I want to be used of him this week. Maybe today the Holy Spirit, whose ministry is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, is convicting you of sin. 
The Holy Spirit right now is letting you know you have fallen short of God's glory and you have tried with your own righteousness to be back in good favor, but you can't be. You can never be good enough to gain his favor, but Jesus has done it all. And if you trust him today, if you place your faith in him, your sin paid for by him, then he gives you his righteousness, which is what you need for heaven. It's a free gift. And then there's no judgment because you're no longer part of the world system. So there's no judgment. There's just eternal life and eternal happiness. Yesterday, I was at a funeral of a good friend of mine who passed away. He was a believer. And I got, I, I got to the church early. So I got to sit there and just stare at the casket and a dead body. And I thought, I don't want to do Then I thought, you know, I do want to sit and look at a dead body. So I did. I, got, I was all alone in the church. It was kind of weird just looking at a dead body. And, I, and you, know, you know why I did that? Because I thought, someday, if the rapture doesn't take place, I'm going to be in a casket like that. And people are going to be able to say, Brian Weed is dead in the body, but he's alive with Christ. He is alive forevermore, free from this earthly sphere and this, this um, system of uh, sin and rebellion. And I thought, I want to live my life so God is glorified on that last day. I want, I want Christ to be glorified even on that very last day. And then I thought of all the people that I know that if they were to die and their body be placed in the front of a church, would be suffering. Um, I pray. I think about that. So are you willing to be saved by God's grace? Or are you willing to be used by the Lord? Father, thank you for this time in your word. It is incredible to think about this ministry of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were so, they were so beside themselves. They were so preoccupied with themselves and the next few days of what they would be doing and where would they eat, where would they sleep, where would Jesus go, when would they see him again. They had all the details of this life that they were so concerned about. They didn't even bother to ask Jesus what he would experience the next three days. And then when Jesus gave them the truth about the Holy Spirit being an advantage to them in his departure, I don't think they still got it. But once the Holy Spirit came and dwelt in them, they understood. We can come to you all day, every day. We carry God with us in our bodies. We are never alone. We have hope and peace and joy through this relationship. And then, Father, when the ministry of the Holy Spirit began in the early church, with the conviction to this world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, thousands were saved. Thousands were saved, and the church multiplied and multiplied. And now we're at kind of towards the end of the harvest, and a few people here and there are born again. I pray, Father, maybe there's somebody today listening to this. Maybe right now the Holy Spirit is working on them, showing them you have, to, you have been trusting the wrong thing. You've been trusting yourself. You've been trusting religion instead of Jesus Christ alone. And maybe right now, Father, they will trust Jesus alone. They will believe that he died for them in their place, and there's nothing they can do to add to it. It is a finished work. And then you will save them, and they will be born again. I pray, Father, that that would take place. And if for anyone, Father, that does that, I pray that they would just talk to people so that they can begin to grow in the faith and, and grow in Jesus Christ. And then, Father... For believers today, maybe there are some who, boy, the Holy Spirit is so busy working on, the Holy Spirit cannot work through. We know that the ministry of the Spirit is to take the Word of God, bring it to light, illuminate it in our minds, and empower us to obey. I pray we would be fervent men and women of the Scriptures, that we would study your Word, know the text, and then be mastered by the text, that we would live out the truth of Jesus Christ, live out the New Testament teachings each and every day. Father, build your church, strengthen your church, L allow this church to rise up and, and really shake Satan's kingdom in northern Minnesota, and we give you the praise and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, well, God bless